Hey, just remember, when someone is baptized in the waters, it is a picture of the work that Jesus Christ has done in their lives. It's a picture, as Barry goes under the water, of how Jesus has washed him clean and made him new. And when Barry comes out of the waters, it's a picture of how Jesus Christ has given him new life. Baptism is so important because when someone is baptized in these waters, they're saying what? They're saying two things. One, because of my faith in Jesus Christ, I am united with Christ. I am in Christ and Christ is in me. And they're also saying through baptism, what Barry's saying through baptism is that he's united with Christ, but he's also united with us, right? You think about Ephesians chapter four, there's one faith, one baptism, right? That we are unified in Christ together and baptism symbolizes that. So Tony, go ahead, brother. Barry, I'm asking you a question. Did you, did you put your trust in Jesus Christ as your savior? I did. All right. So brother, I baptize you today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Grab my arm. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We love you. We praise you for this chance. We thank you for this baptism today. And we just pray that uh, you bless Bear as he uh, serves you, lives for you, and honors you. We thank you for our church, and we thank you for this privilege. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Amen, amen. You can have a seat. You can have a seat. Hey, oh, we had a team this past week go to West Virginia, a team of students and adult leaders that went and ministered there for a week. And then this week, we're getting ready to send teams uh, to both the Dominican Republic and to Boston to serve in places where the gospel is desperately needed. So I want us to take a moment to pray for those teams going to the Dominican Republic and to Boston. So if you're a part of one of those two teams, whether it's the DR or Boston, wherever you are, would you stand up and just stay standing for me, if you will? We want to pray for you. So got some down here, over here, back there, over here. So you see these people that are spread across the room. Wherever you see someone standing, if you would gather around them and lay hands on them and let's pray over them. So right now, the rest of us, just move. Move to some of these people that you see standing. Lay your hands on them. They got one in the back here, over Logan back there. He's leading the team. Go pray over Logan, Jonathan, Eddie back there. Um, so just gather to, over these and let's, let's pray over them. Father, we are so thankful that uh, we get to be a part of your work, your mission. And you have this desire to see people from every tribe, tongue, and nation know your son, Jesus Christ, and live their lives for your glory and honor. And I, I thank you so much for this church, that, uh, that we are a sending church. I thank you that we just got to send out a team to West Virginia and now we get to send out teams to Boston and the Dominican Republic, two very different places. One in, in another country, one in another city in our nation, but two places that desperately need the gospel. I know in the Dominican Republic, there's a lot of poverty and need. I know in Boston, there's a lot of affluence, but a lot of need there as well, spiritual needs. And so, Father, I pray for these two teams as they go to very different places uh, that, that they would go in the power of your spirit. Uh, Father, I am trusting that as they go, they are going uh, with, with full confidence in who they are in Christ. Christ, and they're going to go in the boldness of the Spirit, and they're going to open their mouths regularly and speak the truth of the gospel. I know that they are going to encounter uh, many different people uh, uh, in, in many different places over the next week or so. And Father, I pray that, that as they speak the truth of the gospel into the lives of people, uh, that they would find receptive hearts, that there will be people who are open to hearing about the good news of Jesus, his life, his death, and resurrection. And Father, it's our prayer that as these teachers teams are out serving in different places, that there will be people who come to faith in Jesus Christ, who believe in the risen Lord, who turn from their sins and turn to Christ in faith. And so, Father, we're trusting that you are going to do an amazing work for your own glory uh, through the lives of these that are going. And so, Father, would you please help these people to continue to walk by faith, to continue to have their eyes on you, to continue to know the glory of Jesus Christ, to continue to have a passion for his mission, uh, to continue to love love you with all their hearts and love others well. Father, would you please empower these teams by your spirit to do a good work for your glory. We look forward to their return. We look forward uh, at some point in the near future of hearing about all the different uh, missions teams that have gone out this summer and the work they've done. We look forward to rejoicing with them and how your spirit has been at work through them. And so Father, we send them out with great expectation and we look forward to receiving them home and, and just celebrating your work through them. So Father, be glorified in their efforts, I ask, and I ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Be praying for these teams over the next couple weeks. Pray for them daily as God uses them. Just go ahead and return to your seat. And as you return to your seat, stay standing as we continue to worship together. A great light dawns in Galilee. Some say madman, some say Underworking rebel priest Jesus Christ the Nazarene And he knew well what it would take To free us all from sin and grave A perfect man would have to die Sunday's coming and Don't lose hope cause Sunday's coming and Devil you're done you better start running Friday's good 
And he's coming soon. This next song we're going to sing is a new song. And in the chorus, we're going to sing. It says, oh, Lord, our Lord, may your kingdom come. May your will be done in all the earth. So this morning, as, as, we're, as we're singing this, I pray that, that that is your heart's desire, is to see Christ come. And not only that, but we're living our lives in such a way that is showing him honor, showing him glory, telling others around us about the saving grace that is found in Christ Jesus. So let's sing this next song and think about that as we sing.
Take your Bibles and turn back to the book of Proverbs. We're continuing our study in the book of Proverbs. And this morning, we're going to start in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 29. I'm going to read to you several Proverbs, but let's start there. Go ahead and find in your Bibles Proverbs 14, verse 29. If you did not bring a Bible with you, that's okay. In the seat in front of you down in the book rack, you'll find a copy of the Bible. Pick that Bible up and find Proverbs 14 with us. Uh, if you don't own a Bible, we would love for you to take that Bible home with you, read it, learn about the God that loves you and desires or relationship with you. Uh, if you're new to the Bible, Proverbs is easy to find. It's right in the middle of your Bible. If you'll open your Bible up to the middle, you'll likely fall in the book of Psalms. If you're in the Psalms, go one book over and you'll be in Proverbs. Proverbs 14, 29 is where we'll start together this morning. So if you're new to our church, we've been walking through the book of Proverbs um, for some time now, for several months, and, and we walk through chapters 1 through 9, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. That's what we typically do at Northwood. We take books of the Bible like Proverbs and walk through them chapter by chapter, verse by verse. But now we're in this middle section, Proverbs 10 through 29, that we're dealing with a little bit differently. We're dealing with it more thematically. And so we're not going chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We're, we're looking at different topics uh, that Solomon talks about in the books of Proverbs. And we're talking through those specific topics. And so it's more thematic, if you will. And so last week we looked at the issue of, of speech and how the Proverbs tell us to use our words. And this morning, oh, it's gonna be a lot of fun. We're looking at the issue of anger and how the book of Proverbs calls us to handle our anger. And so we'll start in Proverbs 14, 29, and we'll look at several other Proverbs along the way to help us think about how to handle our anger in a way that honors the Lord. Hey, I found a really fun article this week, and maybe you saw it. Um, you're not gonna believe this. It was really great. So it was, a, it was an article about the 20 worst cities for commuters. Y'all, we did it. <laughs> we did it like, like, like we made the list, right? Like, like we were number 14 on the list. Isn't that amazing? Like we did it. And, and if you just moved to Charleston, like you're part of the reason why we, made, we did it. So thank you, right? Like appreciate you helping us out a bit. Like we are number 14 on the list. Of, what I found interesting, um, Atlanta wasn't on the list. What? I know, I know. That's what I thought too. We're worse than Atlanta. Isn't that great? Like, I'm, we did it. Now, 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 with that said, so, so you know the frustrations. If, if you live in the Charleston area, which you do because you're here, right? We, we all complain about the traffic. We know it's gotten worse and it's going to get worse. And it's going to eventually take you six hours to get from Somerville to Northwood. And I understand that. So, so you know how bad it's getting, right? And, and the little article proves that traffic's getting back. So with the bad traffic, with the congestion, comes something that we call road rage. You act like you know what I'm talking about. So, so, so not only was Charleston listed as one of the top 20 worst cities for commuters, in the last couple of years, AAA, you know who AAA is, uh, they did a survey and found out in their survey that over the last few years, road rage in general in our country has increased by 80%. You say, wow, but that's really your fault because you're part of the problem. 80%, that means eight out of 10 of us in this room, we got some road rage. So, so let me ask you some questions. And, and so, so if you've ever yelled at someone from your car, have any of you ever done that? Okay, yeah, you're, you're being honest. That's some road rage, right? Now, I don't understand that because when you yell at somebody from your car, like they can't hear you and it doesn't really do any good, but we do that, right? Some of you, like, listen, and, and don't raise your hands on this one because I don't wanna know. Some of you have given some hand gestures from your car, right? Like, like that's road rage. Right? How many of you, and listen, don't raise your hand and I don't wanna be in front of you, on, but how many of you, when somebody cuts you off in traffic, you intentionally tailgate them? So you've done that, haven't you, right? I, I know, like you're, you're bad, I get it. I mean, and so, so think about all those different ways. Road rage has gotten so bad in our country as a whole, there are actually an increase in cases of murders that have been induced by road rage. It's real. So you understand this. We live in a culture that it doesn't take much to get us mad. And some of you experience that on a daily basis when you drive the streets of Charleston. You're amazed at how fast you get angry. And we live in a culture that just in general, just in general, we're, we're an angry nation, right? Like you understand that. Uh, you, you, if you watch media, if you're on social media or whatever the case may be, it seems like everybody is angry about everything. 
You follow? Like we really live in a very unique time. A time where we should be pretty happy. Modern medicine, you know, modern technology, like all these blessings of life, but yet we are some very angry people. And, and now, come on, come on. Some of you in this room, uh, your spouse sitting next to you, you wouldn't describe yourself this way, but your spouse sitting next to you, you might say, or your friend sitting next to you might say, hey, you've got a pretty short temper. Some of you laugh because it's you, right? Like, you, you understand, like, this is an area that seems like we all struggle with at some point of, of being an angry people, and not only being an angry people, but not knowing how to handle our anger. And, and you understand this, I don't have to tell you this, that, that not all anger is bad. Anger can actually be very helpful if anger leads you to right action. There are some things that you need to be angry about. There are injustices in this world that you should be angry about that lead you to some right action. But the reality is, and you know this like I do, is that, that we don't tend to get angry about the things we need to be angry about. We tend to get angry about things that really aren't a big deal. That in the big scheme of things don't matter eternally. I know it frustrates you when that person cuts you off in traffic. And I know you yell at them because I do too. I get that. But in the big scheme of things, eternally, it's just not that big of a deal. But those are the kinds of things we tend to get angry about. And, and what happens in our angle, anger, instead of right action, is often bad action. That we oftentimes react sinfully when we get angry. You've all been there. You know what anger is. Anger is that displeasure or annoyance at something that doesn't go your way. And when something doesn't go your way and it makes you angry, you often, I often, we often respond sinfully. So the book of Proverbs is very helpful because I bet you in this room, we've all thought about ways that we can manage our anger. And maybe you've got some strategies for managing your anger and not flying off at the handle. Maybe you, you take some deep breaths or you count to 10 or whatever the case may be. But God's word has some very wise ways, ways for us to handle our anger. So we're gonna survey the book of Proverbs and see what the book of Proverbs has to say about handling our anger. And I wanna walk you through the book of Proverbs and show you what I think are three ways that the book of Proverbs is calling us to handle our anger. So take your Bibles, Proverbs 14, 29. Go ahead and rise to your feet as we honor the reading of God's word. Go to Proverbs 14, 29 and listen to what the Bible says. A patient person shows great understanding, but a quick-tempered one promotes foolishness. Go over to Proverbs 19, 11. Proverbs 19, 11 says this. A person's insight gives him patience and his virtue is to overlook an offense. Let me read one more to you. Go over to Proverbs chapter 29, verse 22. Proverbs 29, 22 says this. An angry person stirs up conflict and, an, and a hot-tempered one increases rebellion. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this morning and thank you for time to be together to worship and to listen to your word. And we want to be a people now that as we worship and as we worship through the preaching of your word, we want to respond to you in, in obedience and surrender and faith. And Father, we admit that we're a people that struggle with the things that we say, like we talked about last week. And we're a people who struggle with handling our anger well in ways that honor you. And so, Father, would you please help us this morning as we uh, walk through the book of Proverbs together, thinking about this very issue? Would you help us to be sensitive to your spirit's voice? Would you help us to listen carefully to what you're saying? And would you help us to be a people this morning whose hearts are ready to repent in areas where you call us to repentance? And I ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can have a seat. So you've been there. You know what it's like to be angry. You know when things don't go your way and that anger starts to swell up within you. You know how your heart rate increases. You know how, how your blood pressure rises. You know how your body temperature rises. You understand what it feels like to be angry. And you also know what it's like to respond in anger. And so I want you to think right quick, quickly. I want you to think about this first way that I want you to respond in, when you're angry. When you're angry, I want you to know this. I want you to know that God is patient in his righteous anger. Now, here's what you should know. That God is also angry. But he's angry in a very different way than you are. Think about this. Think about this. Proverbs 14, 29, we read it. A patient person shows great understanding, but a quick tempered one promotes foolishness. Now, there are those of us in this room, and we know it about ourselves, who are quick 
tempered. And there are those of us in this room who know that we struggle with patience. That when we get angry, we immediately fly off the handle. We immediately say things that we regret later. We immediately do things that we know we should not do in our anger. I want you to know that God is angry as well. Now, for very different reasons than why you are typically angry. Because again, you typically typically get angry at things that just don't matter in the big scheme of things. You get angry, right, when, when uh, that teenager rolls her eyes at you. <laughs> you get angry, right, when your husband leaves his dirty clothes on the floor instead of putting them in the laundry room. You get angry when your wife does this or when your friend does that. You get angry at all kinds of things that probably are nothing more than minor inconveniences in your life. God is angry at something very specific. God is angry at sin. And rightly so. I mean, think about the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve sinned against God, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, they rebelled against his word. That God is good, he's right, and he's holy, and he's loving. But Adam and Eve made the choice to rebel against our good, loving, and holy God. God had every right to be angry at sin, at the rebellion of Adam and Eve. And God has every right to continue to be angry at the sin and rebellion and rejection of him that he sees in this world. In fact, here's what I want you to understand. Your anger is often unjustified, but God's anger is justified. Again, you often get angry at things that really aren't that big of a deal, but God is angry at something that is a big deal. His anger is justified. Psalm 711 says this, God is a righteous judge and a God who shows his wrath every day. Listen, I, I know what you're thinking because you're here in this church and you've read the Bible maybe a little bit and, and you've been a part of a Christian church where you hear a lot that God is love and God is compassionate and merciful and all those things are certainly true and it kind of jolts us a bit when we read this passage that said God is angry every day. There's not a day that goes by that God is not angry at sin. And you know it like I do, when you look at this world around us, there's a whole lot of sin. There's a whole lot of brokenness. There's a whole lot of rebellion against God. And God is right to be angry at the sin that he sees in this world. Not only is he right to be angry about it, he's right to do something about it. Because not only do we believe that God is angry, we also believe that God is just. That, that if God is just, he just can't overlook sin because sin is a big deal. It is a rejection of the God of all creation. It is rebellion against his good and perfect will. And so if God is just, then he must what? He must deal with sin. God can't just look at your sin and sweep it under the rug and not deal with it or pretend like it never happened. That would be a very unjust thing to do. God has to deal with it in his righteous anger. And he does. You know what God has done for you. God is angry at sin, but at the same time, he is loving. At the same time, he is patient. At the same time, he is compassionate. And this God who is angry and also compassionate in his love and grace and mercy sent his son into this world. And Jesus, the one who was fully God and is fully man, Jesus Christ lived the life that you could not live. He never rebelled against God. He never rejected him. He was perfect in every way and then went to a cross. And at the cross, what happened? At the cross, God's justice was served. At the cross, our heavenly father dealt with our sins. At the cross, he punished Jesus in our place. At the cross, justice was served. And at the cross, Jesus, the God-man, the only begotten son of God, what did he do? He absorbed, he took on the wrath of God, the anger of God in our place. God's anger or his wrath was satisfied at the cross. And so now if you are of faith, if you believe that Jesus Christ died in your place and rose again, and if you turn from your sins in repentance, the anger of God, this is the good news of the gospel, the anger of God is not pointed towards you. Do you follow me? 
The anger of God is not pointed towards you if you're a follower of Jesus. Because at the cross, the anger of God was satisfied. His anger towards your sin was taken care of through the death and resurrection of his only begotten son. Now that's good news for you. That you do not have to worry about an eternity apart from from God, punished for your sins because of your faith in Jesus. But if you have not placed your faith in Jesus, it's a different story. In fact, John 3, 36, the Bible says this, Jesus says this, the one who believes in the Son has eternal life, but the one who rejects the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. Listen very carefully. If you are not a follower of Jesus, if you've never placed your faith or trust in him, the wrath of God remains on you because you are rejecting the free gift of God's grace. And so I would call you this morning to not reject it any longer, that you can escape the anger of God by placing your faith in the Son of God who went to the cross for you on your behalf. You follow me? So what we see in Scripture is God is certainly angry, but in his anger, he's also very patient. Going to the next slide. You often lack patience in your anger. You know that. But God remains patient. He's gracious and merciful even in his anger. Psalm 103 looks forward to the cross of Christ and says this. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in faithful love. He will not always accuse us or be angry forever. He has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our iniquities. Or think about 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient towards you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Here's what God could do, and not only God could do, but God would be right to do. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, it would have been right for God to stop it then, to wipe out humanity, right? Or think about the book of Exodus, when the Hebrew people are wandering around in the wilderness complaining, it would have been right for God to end it all then. Come on now, you live in the 21st century and you look out at this world and you see all the rebellion against God. It would be right for God right now to end everything, but he doesn't. He's patient. Why? Because he desires that all come to repentance. God desires for more people to trust in his son, Jesus Christ, to turn from their sins and turn to him by faith. And so God is patient in this world. He's patient and long-suffering, putting up with the rebellion of people, knowing that there will be more people who come to faith in Jesus Christ as his church goes forward and spreads the gospel. In fact, the Lord does not delay. It goes back one more time, please. The Lord does not delay his promise as some understand delay, but is patient toward you. That toward you, he's speaking of the church. He's patient toward us because we're hard-headed as the people of God. And we resist living on the mission of God. But God puts up with his church and he continues to encourage us and push us towards his mission. All that to say, I want you to get this big view in your mind. That we are a people who struggle with anger. God is angry too. But God is angry at the right thing. He's angry at sin. And in his anger, and he has every right to be angry, he still what? Demonstrates lots of patience, lots of kindness, lots of mercy, and lots of compassion. And ultimately, what God is going to do, he's going to restore everything. He's going to make everything right. And he does that by allowing his anger to be satisfied at the cross. This past week, I had a home project to do. So, so our bathroom, the, the, the shower and the master bathroom, you know how it goes over time. Like you got all that caulk in there and, and all that caulk just over time. We try to clean it the best we can and you know, all the different tips and tricks. But, but just over time, it just got a little mildewy, a little moldy. It was honestly quite disgusting, right? And so like I'd watched YouTube to try to find some tricks to clean it because what I didn't want to do if I could help it was to replace the caulk. Not because I couldn't do it, but like I had not done that before. So I knew it would be a new project for me and and I know some of you guys can do that in like 30 seconds. I get that, but it was new for me, right? And so like I was trying to avoid that. So I, you know, I, I did all these tips and tricks to try to clean it and, and nothing worked. And so, okay, we've got to replace the caulk. And so I don't know, because I would not done it before, I watched, but you know, 45 
videos on YouTube on how to do it well. And, 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 and when you watch those YouTube videos, like they do it so well. You know what I'm saying? Like you know, the, the guy gets there and like in 30 seconds, he's got the whole job done. It's like, so, so it makes it sound really, really easy. And so, so I got my little caulk scraper tool from uh, Amazon and I got my things of caulk. I'm ready to go. And I, and I start removing that caulk from the bathroom. Now it was coming up, but it was not working like it was working on YouTube. You follow? Like I, I put that, that caulk tool in there and I, I started to bring it out and I was, I was trying to be patient, you follow? And try just to very slowly pull that stuff out and it without fail, like I would, I would pull a little bit out and then it would tear and I have to get back in there and start digging it out again. And, 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 and two hours later, right? Like I'm, I'm still pulling caulk out of that thing. It took forever. But I finally got all the caulk out, right? And I lost my patience a few times. I screamed at the caulk a few times, all those kind of things that you would have done too. But I finally got it out. And once I finally got it out, then I put that new caulk in. That was a whole lot easier putting in than taking it out. But still with that, you had to have some precision, put my finger in there, make sure everything matched up right. And I don't know, I mean, 14 hours later, the job was done. You follow. Then I stood back and looked. My bathroom. That shower looks like, I just want to take a shower all day now. You follow what I'm saying? Like, like it looks amazing. It's so pearly white. Like all that nasty mildew and mold is gone. Like it looks like it has been restored. But getting to that place of restoration took what? Work. Took a lot of digging out the mold and all those kinds of things. And I tell you that, just tell you this, right? God is doing a work in you. A patient work. He's doing a work in this world. A patient work, right? He does not wipe us out because the goal is restoration. There's going to come a day that we stand in a new heavens and new earth because God, who is angry at sin, in his anger has put it away at the cross and has determined in his patience and grace to do a work in us, to bring us to a place of restoration, that's what's happening in your life right now. Now let's get back to the book of Proverbs. I gave you all that to bring us back to Proverbs. I want you to have this view of how God deals with his anger so you can know how to deal with your anger because this God who is patient and gracious in his anger has called you to be the same way. Ephesians 5.1, be imitators of God. Be patient in your own anger. So listen, listen, listen. That first way that, that I think we're being called to deal with our anger is one, just to realize that God is angry as well, but deals with his righteous anger in much patience. And watch this. What I need to do is ask God to help me to act patiently and graciously when I am angry. I need to ask God to help me act patiently and graciously when I am angry. Because I think about God's patience. I ain't nothing like that. And you probably aren't either. You fly off the handle way too fast. You've got that short fuse. You've got that quick temper. And again, here's what Proverbs is calling us to. Proverbs 16, 32. Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit than he, than he who takes a city. There is real power in being able to control your anger, to be slow to anger, to have patience. The problem is we're not so slow to anger. We get so annoyed by the inconveniences of life. We get so annoyed when people say stuff that we don't like. We get so annoyed when our feelings are hurt by someone else. We're not very slow to anger. And the question is, why is that? Why is it that you are so quick to lose your temper? Why is it that you have such a short fuse? I'll tell you why. And you know why. In the book of James, James writes and says what? There's a war going on inside of you. There are passions that are warring against each other. And those passions lead to conflict and murder and strife. Bottom line is the reason why you fly off the handle so quickly. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but this is just reality. The reason why you fly off the handle so quickly is because you're selfish. Because I'm selfish. Our self-centeredness right, is what leads us to respond in anger. Listen to what Proverbs 29, 22 says. A man of wrath stirs up strife, and one given to anger, watch, causes much transgression. When you are that person who's not slow to anger, and you fly off the handle quickly when you're offended, how much more sin does that usually lead to? A lot. 
Because you end up saying things that are hurtful. You begin doing things that are hurtful. Some of us can look back at relationships and we can see the damage that we have caused because we could not control our anger. We can see how our anger led to a host of other sins because we weren't able to rein it in. Do you follow me? And so listen, listen, listen. I just want you to stop. And every time you feel angry this week, I want you to ask yourself really just two questions. Let me show you. I want you to ask yourself two questions when you begin to feel angry this week. One, what is it that I want so badly that I'm willing to yell at someone, abuse someone, or neglect someone in order to get it? Because some of you act that way. When you don't get your way, you start yelling. For some of us, it's, our anger is so out of control, it has crossed in and over into abuse. With your words, or maybe even physical, or neglect. And so in that moment, when you feel that anger come on, what is it? What is it that you want so badly that's causing you to respond in that way, in those sinful ways? And what you're gonna probably find out if you had the state of mind to stop and ask yourself that question, what you're probably gonna find out, it's a selfish want. Somebody inconvenienced you. Somebody stepped on your toes. Somebody did something you did not like. And that's leading you to have that response. And then the question is, why? Why is it that I want something so badly that I'm willing to yell at someone, abuse someone, or neglect someone in order to get it? And so one, what is it that you want so bad? And two, why is it that you want it so badly? And what you'll probably find out again is because there's something wrong in you. It's probably not the person that you're angry at as much as it is you. There's something going on in your heart that you have not dealt with. There's a self seriousness that you're unwilling to let go of. This is why I think we're being reminded, one, of the anger of God. That in God's anger, he's patient and compassionate and gracious and still chooses to treat us with love. You don't do that when you're angry. You fly off the handle, I fly off the handle. And so it really is reflecting on how God deals with his righteous anger and then asking God, begging God to help us respond in a way that is consistent with the character of Christ. And then finally, think about this. Think about this, third way. Start treating people with patience and grace instead of treating people with anger. Then it's beginning to take, right? It's acknowledging and knowing how God is angry and what he does in his anger. It's asking God to help us to respond in the same way that he does. Are you with me still? And then finally, it's taking some practical steps towards people, towards those inconveniences that reflect the character of God. And this is where the book of Proverbs gets really helpful. Let me help you. For example, what the book of Proverbs reminds us is to let God deal with the hearts of people. Proverbs 20, 22. Don't say, I will avenge this evil. Wait on the Lord and he will rescue you. What a wonderful verse, because you know it like I do, that when there's that inconvenience in life, when that person annoys you, when that person doesn't do this thing you thought they would do, or when he says that or she says that, and, and all of a sudden you're annoyed and you're angry and you're even hurt by what's been done, your most natural response is revenge to get even. I want that person to feel what I'm feeling right now. I want that person to hurt in the same way that they have hurt me. And in that moment, you're not thinking compassion. You're not thinking grace. You're not thinking mercy. You're thinking, I want to see that person get what they have coming to them. And Proverbs simply reminds us, right? Don't say, I will avenge this evil. Wait on the Lord. Let God take care of that situation. Let God, God, I don't know if you know this or not, and maybe you don't know this, so let me tell you, God is very, very good at dealing with the hearts of people. He's just really good at it. In fact, he's the master of it. He knows exactly how to minister to you, and he knows exactly how to be at work in the life of that person you're so angry at. And so leave it in his hands. And that is freeing, my friend. Now, I'm not saying overlook necessarily big, grievous sins, but I am saying, right, there's a heart motivation that you need to be aware of. When you are hurt, what do you want for that person that hurts you? Do you want the worst for them or do you want the best for them? You see what I'm saying? When we rebelled against God, you know what God wanted for us? He still wanted the best for us, a relationship with him. 
Do you follow me? So let God deal with the hearts of, the, of people. Go to the next one if you don't mind. And don't, this is so helpful. Don't engage every conversation. Stay away from a foolish person. You will gain no knowledge from his speech. Proverbs 14, 7. That's really helpful. Now, I'm not saying this. Listen, listen. I'm not saying that your husband is foolish. I'm not saying that your wife is foolish. I'm not saying that your children are foolish. I'm not saying that your friends are foolish. I'm not saying that your coworkers are foolish. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that, that, that every one of us have a tendency at times to act foolishly. You would agree with that. And you've been in conversations. Maybe it has been with your spouse. Maybe it has been with your girlfriend. Maybe it has been with that friend. Maybe it has been with that coworker. You've been in conversations where someone said something to you that was downright foolish. It could have been something hurtful. It could have been something that was just dumb. You follow? Somebody said something foolish to you and now all of a sudden you want to engage that foolish talk. And, and, and you might engage it foolishly. You might talk back and say something in response that's just as hurtful or mean as what was said to you. And the next thing you know, right, angers are flaring, tempers being lost and all those kinds of things and we're in an all out war. Sometimes it's wise, listen to me very carefully. Sometimes it's wise to know when to walk away from a conversation. Do you follow me? Sometimes it's okay to say, listen, I'm just stepping back. This conversation isn't going anywhere right now. So I'm going to step back from this conversation, collect myself because I can feel myself getting angry and I might say something sinful, so I'm going to step back. You don't have to engage every foolish conversation. You can walk away from the conversation and then come back later once you've had time to process and think through and pray about how to respond to that particular situation in wisdom. It is okay to walk away from a conversation that you see going in a sinful direction. Does that make sense to you? Listen, listen, listen. Here we are, come on now, we are in a political season. We will elect a president in a few months. I cannot wait to get the thing over with, right? It is okay for you to turn off media right now. Because come on now, come on now, you know this, we've talked about this before. Right now, every time you turn on media and you hear one of those candidates speaking, you get mad. And you tell everybody else how mad you are about it. I get it, I'm mad too. You can turn it, you did not have to watch all 90 minutes of that debate. You follow me? In fact, five minutes was enough. There wasn't nothing you learned in that debate, was there? No, you could turn it off if it was making you mad. You see what I'm saying? Like, you can walk away from that stuff that, that entices in you that anger. You don't have to constantly engage fools or foolish talk. That makes sense. So don't engage every conversation. Go on next one. I love this next one. Learn to overlook minor offenses and handle major offenses biblically. Now, there are times that you and I need to bear down when someone sins against us and address the sin, right? Matthew 18, Jesus walks us through a process for that. If someone sins against you, willfully sins against you, go to them, talk to them, tell them the offense, work it out. And if it doesn't resolve, bring up along a brother or a sister in Christ and try it again. And he gives us steps to do that. And so there is certainly a time where we need to engage that person who's hurting us and confront them in their sin very graciously and very lovingly. And Jesus lays out a process for us in Matthew chapter 18 to do that. However, on the flip side, there's a lot of things in life you just need to learn to overlook. And it is a great and wonderful gift to be able to overlook minor offenses. This is what Proverbs says, and I love this. A person's insights gives him patience, and his virtue is to overlook an offense. Or think about this. Proverbs 12, 16 takes it a step further. A fool's displeasure is known at once, but whoever ignores an insult is sensible. Here, listen, listen. Some of you aren't going to believe this, but it's true. Watch. Come on, come on. Real close. Listen, listen. You don't have to get mad about everything. Do you follow me? But some of us do. Like, if I look at you the wrong way, you ready to fight me. I get it. Like, that's where some of us live. Like, we're just always looking for a fight. That's a terrible way to live. And you don't have to live that way. There are lots of offenses that you can overlook because in the big scheme of things, there's just not that big of a deal, right? Let me give you some examples. There's a multitude when your husband leaves his dirty clothes on the floor and doesn't put them in the hamper. I get it, it makes you mad. 
But you can overlook that. When your wife does whatever, it makes you mad. I get it. But it's not sinful necessarily. You can overlook that. Stacy and I, while I love my wife with all of my heart, and I'm so thankful God has placed her in my life, we are very different in a lot of ways, right? I've got one speed, extra fast. That's all I know, right? Like, I want to go faster right now. I'm holding myself back. You follow? Stacy has one speed, extra slow. Like, I don't know how we get anywhere. You, you follow? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm always 10 steps ahead of her. She gets mad because I don't stand back and hold her hand and because I, I'm, I'm, already, I'm already down the street and she's still back. We're just very opposite. And it's easy for us to get frustrated. When she's not ready to go, when I'm ready to go, it's easy for me to get frustrated. Or when I'm not showing her enough patience because I'm ready to go and she's not, it's easy for her to get frustrated. Are those sin issues? Not necessarily. We're just different, Right? And it would save me a lot of frustration just to overlook that sometimes. And it would save her a lot of frustration if she would overlook my fast and just accept it for what it is. You see what I'm saying? Like, I don't have to get mad about everything and you don't either. There's a lot of things in life that you can just overlook and move on with life and you'll be much more content and joy-filled if you will learn to overlook those minor offenses. Isn't that what right, Stacey? You're great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I get the stage and she doesn't. But that's another story for another day. So, so, yeah, so, so, but you can, you can learn to overlook even when someone insults you. Listen, sometimes it's even okay to overlook someone who calls you a bad name and just move on with life, right? Like that's just part of life. You don't have to be mad about everything. And finally, look at, listen to this. Be quick to listen. Proverbs 18, 13. The one who gives an answer before he listens, this is foolishness and disgrace for him. You've been there. You know how it happens. That person says something to you that immediately sets you off. And in that moment, when you're set off, you're ready to go. You're ready to fight. You're ready to yell. You're ready to scream. And you don't take the time to what? Actually step back and listen to what the person was actually saying. How many of your conflicts could be resolved if you would just take more time to listen to people? You see what I'm saying? Like in your anger, you tune out. In your anger, you're not willing to show compassion. In your anger, you're not willing to give the benefit of the doubt. In your anger, you're not willing to hear that person's perspective. You see what I'm saying? Think about this last one. Be quick to listen and don't give up on reconciliation. Proverbs 14, 9. Fools mock at making reparation, but there is good will among the upright. Listen, listen, look up here real close. Here's the deal. Some of us in this room, we know this is our struggle. We know that we are an angry people, that it doesn't take much to set us off. And here's what some of us also know, but because of our anger, we have hurt some people. Some of us in this room, it would be fair to say, have hurt some people tremendously because of our inability to control our anger. Fools mock at making reparation, but there is goodwill among the upright. What's the step you take? Listen, if you've hurt someone because of your angry ways, the step to take is to make it right. To go to that person you've hurt and say, listen, I know this is a struggle for me. I know I have a short fuse, but I'm asking God to help me. I'm trusting that the power of the Spirit will work inside of me to change me. And I want you to help me with that as well. And so part of dealing with an angry heart is just confessing to that person or those people you've hurt how your anger has hurt them, right? Or think about this. The one who conceals his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them will find mercy, Proverbs 28, 13. There, it is good for you to be able to come before those people that you've hurt in your anger and just confess it like I messed this up. Will you help me? Will you pray for me? Some of us refuse to confess sins like pride, like sins of speech, like sins of anger that we've looked at for the last three weeks because of our pride. We don't want to admit that we might have handled something poorly. We don't want to admit that we're wrong. And, and, and we're more willing to damage a relationship than we are to admit our sins. And it shouldn't be that way, right? And so listen, listen, don't give up on reconciliation. People are far more important than your need to be right all the time. Relationships are far more important than that selfish need to prove your point. Do you follow what I'm saying? And for some of us in this room, the response to what we're seeing in the book of Proverbs this morning is just to admit it and ask forgiveness. 
from other people and to ask forgiveness from God, to run back to him and say, God, would you please help me to deal with my angry heart? And so if you're in this room this morning and you're a follower of Jesus, you might be realizing in these moments that you've got some work to do that you've got some work to do in this area. And the good news for you is that Jesus Christ is with you. He loves you. He wants to change you in this area. If you're willing to come before him, to confess it to him and to confess it to those you love. So we might help you to learn how to walk in joy and peace and kindness and humility instead of always walking around in anger. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not a follower of Jesus. Listen, this is big for you. If you're not a follower of Jesus, listen very carefully, come on. If you're not a follower of Jesus, right now, in this moment, you are under the wrath of God. And you will get what you deserve. And what you deserve for your sin and rebellion against God is an eternal hell, punishment for your sins. That's what the Bible clearly teaches. However, God has provided a way of escape. His son, Jesus Christ, who went to the cross and endured the wrath of God for you. So you could experience the compassion and grace and mercy of our heavenly father. And if you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, today is the day to do so. To believe that Jesus died in your place and rose again for you. So all of your sins could be forgiven and you could be given the gift of life, abundant and eternal. In the corners of this room, there are two crosses. We're gonna have a time of invitation. We're gonna stand and sing together. There'll be someone at one of those crosses who's there to receive you, to pray with you and to help you today begin a relationship with Jesus. Go to one of those crosses now and, and let that person know that you're ready today to give your life to Jesus. If you are a follower of Jesus, today is a day of repentance. If this is an area you struggle in, come before God. Come before your brothers and sisters and say, help me. I repent. I turn. I want to see the Spirit change this in my life. However the Spirit of God is calling you to respond this morning, you respond in faith and obedience. Thank you, Jesus, for this morning. Thank you for your work of grace and mercy in our lives, that Jesus, you're willing to die in place and rise again so all of our sins can be forgiven and we can be given life abundant and eternal. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are kind and compassionate. You are right. You are right to be angry at sin. And you are compassionate enough to deal with our sin at the cross of Jesus Christ. If there's one in this room this morning, who has never placed his faith or her faith in Jesus Christ. I pray that person would come trusting you as Lord. And Father, for those of us who are followers of you, may we be a people who put away anger, who put away the sinful um, actions that sometimes follow an angry heart. Would you teach us to be people who are angry at the right things, sins and injustice? Would you teach us to be a people who in our anger, still are able to respond in compassion and grace, would you teach us to be a humble, forgiving people? So Father, in these moments, we're trusting that your spirit is at work within us. Help us now to respond to your spirit in repentance and faith and obedience and ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You rise your feet as a time of invitation together. You come now as the spirit of God leads you. There's a peace I've come.